Okay, today we're going to start the chapter on language. And language is exciting because it ties together all the different things we've been talking about so far. So it's a nice kind of capstone uh, way to integrate everything we've learned about perception, attention, motor, uh, control, memory, executive function. Perception, word reading, and how you process words and translate them into auditory phonological outputs, how we produce uh, speech, all those strange things that are happening in the motor uh, control pathways of your throat, lips, mouth, and even deeper there in the glottis. There's a lot about memory, episodic memory, uh, semantic memory, your knowledge of what words mean, um, this kind of really amazing fact that you can read a book and understand and remember so much information. If you think about the memory capacity that you have for stories, it's just amazing relative to, you know, arbitrary um, random facts. Uh, there's a lot of involvement of frontal cortex function in language, the ability to maintain your context as you're talking with another person, uh, you know, thinking about what has been said, what hasn't been said, what needs to be uh, said. There's all these Gricean maxims of efficient speech so that you uh, only say the things that you know the other person hasn't uh, needs to hear and that involves a theory of mind. You have to understand what the other person might understand and not understand and this is particularly taxing when you're thinking about teaching. As an expert in this area you know so much and it's hard to know what you know the new student approaching this material is actually going to be thinking about and what perspectives they're going to have. And of course, each student has a different perspective, so it's really impossible. <laughs> Speech output at every level. And so you have the very most detailed kind of sequencing of the motor com commands to produce the speech sounds, but then this larger time scales of organizing um, verbal output at the level of sentences and longer time scale. Um, all of that involves these kind of sequencing, planning, integration kind of processes, and ultimately, you know, motivation, what do you want to say, what are you trying to communicate, all these kinds of questions that the frontal cortex is so important for. So really, language is everything in the brain. It's, it's really hard to localize. We have one label here that says language right here, but really, if you think about it, uh, all these different aspects of language involve all of the different brain areas working together in a coordinated fashion. In, in addition, it's also quite clear that language supports all of cognition. And so it's very clear that we as humans have cognitive abilities that other animals do not have and that a lot of the responsibility for that kind of special ability can be attributed to language. Our ability to encode information in flexible, systematic, structured ways through sentences and words and, and, and these constructs that we can juggle around in our minds, hold on to, maintain, and kind of represent information that's not currently present, that all of those abilities that we have through language uh, are really unique and important for supporting higher level cognitive function. And we really don't know in detail exactly how much of our cognitive abilities depend on these kind of language foundations. Um, but we do know that if you don't have language, you don't exhibit those things. And if you do, you at least have the capability of, of doing these things. Although uh, we can look at various populations who have, you know, intact language abilities, but maybe uh, reduced uh, kind of frontal cap capabilities or other kinds of aspects of cognition. And so you can see there are dissociations. So the, the topic of language inevitably raises this question about the extent to which language depends on special purpose neural mechanisms. And there are certain things about language that really make it special, um, as we were just saying. So this ability to refer to things that are not present, this symbolic ability to represent something, I can uh, say max and picture my son and, uh, and, and have a representation even if he didn't happen to be sitting on the couch next to me. I can organize 
my uh, words into so many different combinations, an infinite, essentially infinite number of different combinations, yet still follow these basic rules. And that combination of kind of open-ended uh, combinatorial flexibility, uh, but also structure that you get with syntax is, you know, essentially unique with language. I mean, you can see it in a lot of other motor control domains, um, especially if you start uh, doing an instrument, uh, playing the piano or guitar, you get, you know, combinations of different motor actions and you have a lot of open-ended uh, possibilities there, but nothing quite on the same scale as language itself. Also, language is a serial channel. It requires taking this huge parallel knowledge representations in your mind and squeezing them out somehow over this very narrow bandwidth channel of speech or writing. Um, and that is painful as an author, um, sometimes painful as a, a reader or a, someone who's listening. Um, you know, if the information is not the ones you want to actually hear right now, you know, you get frustrated and in some ways it's easier to be able to have parallel access to everything. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we do know that uh, it's, it's, it's very important to process information in certain ways, in a sequential way. And so that ability to kind of structure and organize sequences of thoughts and engage in this kind of binding mechanisms that tie together all the different aspects of a mental representation um, at each moment in time as this kind of language is unfolding, that probably is very important, and it may be that sequential aspects of language are actually essential. Language enables cultural transmission in a way that nothing else does, right? You can have nonverbal communication, you could have pheromones, you could have various other forms of, of communication, but that ability to really concretely specify a distributed internal mental representation that is high dimensional and really you know, in some of the best poetry and literature can really deeply capture kind of internal mental states in a way that you really feel like you're, you're connecting with someone at a, at a very deep level. Um, that ability to really transmit uh, across this language channel is unique. I mean, there's no other way you can do that. It makes it also the vehicle uh, of knowledge transfer and the vehicle of education. Um, and again, that's why, in part, we don't know the boundary between, you know, what language enables versus what our brains are natively capable of uh, because language is so intrinsic to everything that we learn. Another aspect of, of language is this kind of embedding, this ability to have kind of subordinate clauses uh, and, and deep levels of structure. This is kind of related to both the sequencing and the syntax issues, but it's kind of a, another example in which language involves uh, kinds of mental representations that are particularly challenging to understand from a neural perspective. How does the brain represent a subordinate clause? How do you take something and kind of push it on the stack and have that kind of outer context while you're processing the inner context? And we have these famous examples that uh, linguists uh, like to talk about. And in fact, the, the field of linguistics is often, you know, characterized sort of somewhat derisively as like, you know, the, the science of example sentences, right? So coming up with these particular examples that really capture something important. So the horse raced past the barn fell. What fell? Did the barn fell? Well, according to proximity, you think the barn fell, but in fact, it was the horse that was raced past the barn fell. And because you didn't specify that, and that is optional, um, this kind of subordinate clause here, modifier, um, can be bound incorrectly. Here's the meta commentary. Isn't it true that example sentences that people that you know produce are more likely to be accepted? So a, a meta comment from one linguist to another. Uh, if you know the linguists, you're more likely to accept their example sentences.